Hello and welcome back to the Life on the Wrist channel. Today we've got a very exciting piece we're going to go into. It's a reference 2627 from Omega. It was the first reference that Omega released with a date complication. It's known as the Seamaster Calendar. I'm going to see if I can get folks for you, but you'll see it, um, it more in depth. We're basically going to do what we always do. Um, we will show you this watch a little bit more in depth, give you the history of the reference, the um, significance of this watch, and sort of the line of Omega pieces that they have released, and um, give you some close-ups of this watch so you can take a look at it. Um, it really is a beautiful piece. Um, it's a significant piece, especially some subtle details around when it was manufactured. So I'm excited to get into it with you. So without further ado, let's get into it. Saying that the reference 2627 was a breakthrough for Omega is a bold statement. Omega has achieved incredible feats in the industry up until this point, and their innovation continued um, straight through to this day today. It, it is also a bold statement because the breakthrough that Omega made with this watch, um, which had to do with the date complication that you see at six o'clock, really was not something new to the watch world. But breakthroughs can be described in, in many different ways. It's not just, it doesn't always have to be the first of the industry or a huge innovation. It can, sometimes impacting other areas of the industry in different ways can be equally as important. Before diving into the 19, into 1951 and the watch at hand, we must first go back to 1948. 1948 was the first year that Omega launched their longest running line of watches, the Seamaster. The Seamasters were based on the designs made for the Bridge Royal Navy towards the end of World War II. The original models had O-ring gaskets used to keep the watches waterproof and were developed to be used in submarines during the war. The Seamaster has obviously evolved into so many different models and incorporate many movements like the infamous coaxial escapement that we see today, but more on that for um, subsequent articles. 1951 was the first year that Omega released the reference 2627 Omega Seamaster. Up until this point, Omega had not released a watch that featured a date complication. Other brands um, had done this though, uh, namely Rolex, who released uh, their first date just in 1945 that had an automatic movement with a date window on the dial at 3 o'clock. The date complication uh, can be seen on the dials um, well before this, though, like in the 1930s. But for Omega, this reference is really historic. As it's the first... It was the first time that Omega decided to compete in the space of having a date on the dials of their watches. This completely changed the aesthetic of the dials of the Seamaster. When a watch company does something like this, it can be a nervous time um, to for the for the company uh, because you you know you never know how the market will react to this um, fairly large change that they um, that that a company makes to um, a dial like, like the Seamaster. I apologize for the focus here. Get you back in focus. Luckily, the watch complications um, were genuinely used as tools during this period. And so the reference 2627's date window at six o'clock was extremely useful to those who decided to um, to buy, wear, and enjoy um, these uh, this uh, specific reference. So to describe the, the reference a little bit more in detail, the reference was brought to the market in a 35 millimeter case, either in stainless steel or a 14 karat gold capped case. The lugs are fairly long as you can see, uh, chamfered and, and have a spring, spring bar holes which are easy to um, switch out straps but I think is uh, an attractive uh, quality in this specific reference. 
The dial of the reference came in a few variations. Black and white dials are probably the most common, as you can see this one has a white dial. Um, but there are some versions of, of the 2627s that featured honeycomb dials that are extremely desirable by collectors and those who enjoy collecting Omega Seamasters and fairly important rare, rare references from the brand. As you can see, the, this version of the, of the 2627 that we have today has the white dial and has retained its original shine through, its, through a bit of age, giving uh, almost like a creamy hue. You'll also notice that if I turn it towards the sun, it becomes a little bit lighter, but if I turn it away, it becomes a little darker, and I think that's an attractive quality of this watch as well. You'll see that the case is gold capped. You can see stainless steel, um, case back and lower portion of the case with the 14 karat <coughs> gold capping on the top of the, um, of the watch. The reference features gold applied hour markers and has an applied uh, Omega logo. Let's get the focus in there for you again. Below the logo, the name, the Omega name and automatic is printed in black text. Towards six o'clock above the date window, you see Seamaster and calendar is printed. Now, looking at the text with the loop on this specific 2627, the Seamaster calendar is a darker font than the Omega automatic text. So it's likely this section of the dial has been um, reprinted in some, some time during its history. So onto sort of the main <laughs> event of the topic, you can look at the date window. So the date window is framed by a gold frame. The, easy, the earlier versions of the 2627 featured a square date window. In 1953, Omega changed the window to feature a trapezoid shape. This reference, uh, this version of the reference has one of these square dates. Now looking at the year that this watch was produced and maybe the title of this video or the article that we wrote, you'll notice that um, the watch has a date of 1951 when we clearly said that the reference was released in 1952. Well, that's because this is likely a very early version of the 2627. Leading up to the release in 1952, the case and movements were likely produced towards the latter part of 1951. And so there are some 2627s out there with serial numbers, ooh, sorry, with serial numbers that place the production year in 1951. We'll speak a little bit more about the production year of this piece, or the production of this piece, um, in, in, in a few moments. Needless to say, I think this makes this watch um, even more important, as it's one of the earliest versions of this groundbreaking reference for Omega, and um, it, it just adds to the story uh, of, this specific, of the reference 2627, being that this was um, manufactured the year before the reference was actually released. Behind the stainless steel screw back, screw down case, which you can see here, is the caliber 353 movement, the beating heart that makes the date complication come to life. The caliber 353 is a bumper automatic movement that was one of two movements fitted to the reference 2627. The other caliber was the caliber 355. Obviously it features a date complication and brought the brand into the discussion when it comes to watches with date complications um, and obviously made it compete with other brands that had this um, had this specific complication and were being used by collectors. The Caliber 353, give me one second, I wanna make sure I got the focus on the dial for you. The Caliber 353 in this watch has an OXG stamp on it. The stamp refers to the Norman Morris imports and the stamp is on the um, bounce wheel um, bridge. Norman Morris was, a, was based in New York and was founded by Norman M. Morris, who was an Austria-Hungarian-born Austria individual who came to New York at the age of three. He began working in the watch business as the delivery boy when he was 15. He then opened up his own company and was selling luxury watches. In 1933, he was, um, he was the sole distributor of Omega watches, and in 1937, Omega started importing watches through his organization. OXG is the import stamp used to reference the importer of the watch into the USA market uh, by Norman Morris. So based on this information, it's likely that the movement was manufactured in Switzerland, 
then imported through New York to the USA market. The case was also likely manufactured in Switzerland. There, there are no stamps that indicate that the case was, was um, manufactured by a company based here, so it's likely that all parts of this watch were imported to the US market and then distributed here in the USA. Um, as far as this watch goes, I think it really is a beautiful piece. I think the lugs of this piece allow it to sit quite um, large on the wrist. If you see it here compared to this Gerard Perigo, which is also 35 millimeters, you can see that it sits quite large. The lugs um, being quite long allow it to stretch quite uh, widely across your wrist. And I think it gives it an overall very, very attractive look uh, for this piece. As I've mentioned, you know, I think this is a historically significant reference for Omega, and I think that makes this watch even more important and, and a nice way to sort of cap off a collection if, if you are looking for something that um, has historical significance for a very important brand. So the reference 2627 is truly a significant watch in the history of Omega. It was the first time the brand was able to showcase this complication on a watch. During this time, it was important for them to create watches that with useful complications, and this allowed them to keep compete with other watch brands who were looking for similar innovations in their own watches. It also stamped the history books with the Omega name uh, quite boldly and led to many other future innovations for the brand. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at this reference 2627. I really do think it is a subtle um, watch that gives um, a lot of significance for the brand and would be an interesting way to sort of cap off a collection in the idea that um, if you're an Omega collector, I think it's a significant piece uh, for for the brand's really history and, and sort of their first dive into using the day complication. But I also think that if you are a collector who likes those subtle details, um, things like who imported the watch, um, where it was imported through, or things like when it was manufactured and uh, how it kind of differs from when the release date for these references were. I think this watch is a really great, um, great piece um, for for that type of collector. And I do think it's just interesting in general when you think about the grand, the bigger story with this uh, specific piece. As always, we will have a video. Uh, excuse me, this is the video. We will have an article on lifenurse.com about this specific piece. So if you want to read more about it, you can head over to lifenurse.com. We'll also have some pictures of the watch over there if you want to check that out. Stay tuned for the other pieces that we're going to be covering. If you want to look at our video from last week, you'll see some of the pieces that we're going to be speaking about over the next couple of weeks. So if you want to get a head start and guess which one is going to be covered in our next video, you can check it out there. Let me know what you think about this Omega, what you think about the reference 2627, and the question for the day for the comments is, um, do you like subtle details or are they just uh, too much to remember when it comes to watch collecting? I'd love to know your thoughts. Um, if you are new to Life on the Wrist, be sure to subscribe and share this video with a friend who might be interested in watches. You can do all of that YouTube stuff for me. It really does help me out. Leave a like if you are feeling generous. And with that said, guys, thank you so much for watching this video and until next time.